Sure. Okay. So we are now recording, and thank you very much, Al, for agreeing to give a little this seminar, and it's all yours. Yeah, great. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's um, actually it's a great opportunity for me, I think, to speak to a community that I don't normally um, speak with, but I, I think that there are some, there's some overlap and in interest here. Uh, and just uh, just a bit, a bit of background uh, for me, I'm, I'm currently an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Washington. Um, I uh, started as an organic chemist, and then I spent 10 years in, um, in industry. I worked for IBM uh, for 10 years working on polymer chemistry, uh, primarily for semiconductors and uh, magnetic storage devices. And then uh, in 2015, I moved to the University of Washington, uh, where I am now, uh, and uh, a part of this transition was to think more about patterning in uh, three dimensions. And, and, and this is probably a good place for, for me to, to start. And that, uh, here, this is just a picture of a, of a laser printer that you might see in your office or um, you know, at home or uh, in many places, uh, but very common. And, uh, if I think back 30 years to what this technology looked like, uh, what we have or were these dot matrix printers. Um, these were, uh, the resolution was poor, they're a lot slower, and, and you can quite literally see the individual pixels of, um, of what you were printing. Of course, now, um, you know, we're not just printing um, with higher resolution and, and faster speeds, but we're also printing in color. And we can also print materials, right? We can print circuits um, two-dimensionally. And if I were to project forward in 30 years to think about you know, what printing is going to look like, uh, what I see is that uh, 3D printing is gonna be um, quite common. And I think that 3D printers will be just as uh, ubiquitous as laser printers are today, and that we'll find them in our homes, in our offices, uh, different workspaces, uh, or even hospitals. So there are a lot of reasons to be excited about uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Uh, companies like uh, Boeing and GE, National Labs, they've been doing this for, for decades already for rapid prototyping and design iteration. So this allows you to very rapidly ideate on new concepts or ideas. Uh, 3D printing can have a huge impact on personalized manufacturing. So it's not a, a one size fits all model, but now uh, more customized or personalized um, parts for the human body. Uh, and then also uh, 3D printing introduces this idea of on-demand manufacturing, where you can produce the parts where you want them and where they are required. So if we step back and look at the additive, manufacturer, additive manufacturing ecosystem, there are three different parts. So um, the first is the hardware or the, the printer itself. There are hundreds of different printers that are available, uh, some commercial, some you can just put together at home or in your garage. Uh, so many different types of printers that are out there. Uh, then there's also the software and modeling. And uh, this is where I think some, a lot of the excitement comes in because uh, with software and modeling, you have this ability to uh, create any object you want in the virtual space, right? So it can be something as simple as a, a spherical structure like a soccer ball, or it can be something entirely made up like a pug with wings, right? So a, a pug with wings does not actually exist, but just represents you know, what's possible and, and what can be created in the virtual world. And with 3D printing, you transfer uh, this object from the virtual space into the real space using a 3D printer. Now, the, the last important component of this ecosystem are the materials. And this is where I, I see there's a lot of opportunity for improvement because um, to, to the, uh, at this moment, uh, most of the materials are based on off-the-shelf materials, things that are readily available, and, and in some instances, polymers that were developed for an entirely different type of manufacturing. And so these, were, these are polymers that were originally developed for um, other extrusion processes or casting or molding methods. And so there really is an opportunity to start thinking about and designing materials that are specific to a 3D printer. 
the mode of operation for most additive manufacturing techniques is, is outlined in this scheme here, where uh, you start with a computer-aided design model or a CAD model. Uh, again, this object only exists in the virtual space. And then use software to slice that model into individual slices. And then, um, and then use a 3D printer to deposit each layer one at a time until you create your final printed part. So you can imagine with the hundreds of different 3D printers that are out there, uh, there are a number of different ways of depositing these layers in an additive fashion. So when it comes to designing materials for uh, a 3D printer, these are the primary considerations then. Uh, so first, uh, what are the, the physical and chemical properties required for the deposition of the material? So as I mentioned, the, the material deposition is what changes from printer to printer. And so you really do have to take that into consideration when you're trying to develop a new material for 3D printing. And then the second, uh, the, the properties of the printed part. Right? So it's, it's not enough that uh, we can use a printer to, to print some multi-layered construct, uh, but the final printed part needs to be functional uh, so we need to make sure that um, it can serve the role that it's been made for. And then finally, uh, the material cost and availability. Uh, so you know, what we found in our labs that we burn through a lot of material um, as we're developing them for printers, uh, but also, um, you know, I, I think as a result, we've focused on materials that can be scaled. Right. Uh, we have a lot of collaborators who um, like to audition our materials or that we're, we're working together with to develop new materials. So what we try to do is to make sure that these materials um, are scalable with a reasonable cost so that we can distribute them to those who are interested in using them. And so here's just my, my quick plug uh, for every lab to have a 3D printer. And these are just uh, some things that, um, that have been printed in the group uh, using uh, just a commercially available filament extruder. So um, this includes printing um, parts that are not available because facilities doesn't know what the part number is, uh, but we can also print different types of molds and uh, holders for different objects in the lab, um, print fun things as well. But, uh, and you, you may remember uh, toward the beginning of the pandemic, there is a shortage of uh, personal protective equipment. And so at the time, uh, my lab was involved in a campus-wide effort to print uh, these plastic headbands onto which you can fix uh, uh, these transparencies to the front and then have it secured using this elastic uh, that we distributed to uh, the area hospitals. All right, so uh, what my lab does is to um, develop or to design polymeric and biohybrid materials uh, that are specifically for additive manufacturing processes. Uh, but for us, the 3D printing component is not uh, the, the final technology. Uh, we see 3D printing as a tool to enable other opportunities, and in particular, um, materials that can, or objects that can mimic or interface with biology. And so this is what it's looked like for us over the last couple of years that I've been at UW. Uh, so we've developed uh, two different material platforms, these tri-block copolymer gels and modified, modified globular proteins. Oops. Um, and these gels we can extrude using um, an extrusion process to create multi-layered designs. Uh, and with these modified proteins, we can actually use light to pattern uh, three-dimensional objects. And then with those in hand, uh, we focus on uh, different applications like engineered living materials, uh, stimuli responsive materials for, for soft robotics, um, uh, soft model, uh, uh, models for soft tissue, and also biodegradable plastics. So, but today what I want to do is to focus on um, our work with engineered living materials. And uh, to, to me, this is a very exciting opportunity that really exists at the interface of two different classes of um, or disciplines of, of science. Um, the first is uh, synthetic biology, and I am by no means a synthetic biologist, but I'm just amazed by um, what we can do in synthetic biology now. And so for me, in, in many ways, uh, the, a cell is a, is a black box 
And all I know is that you can provide a cell these molecular precursors and these cells can be engineered to produce more complex products that are desirable. Uh, and at the same time, I, I am a, a polymer chemist and what I know is that we can now engineer polymers um, to have uh, very specific compositions and architectures such that we can control how they assemble or interact with each other. And uh, we can use that to facilitate the processing or manipulation into uh, macro scale constructs. And so ELMS or engineered living materials really are the interface of these two fields. Uh, and here, uh, what we are focused on is uh, material manufacturing and functionality that is directed by the encapsulated cells. Right, so we need the cells for the, the functionality or, or the purpose, uh, but we need the polymers for the processing and a macro scale uh, construct formation. So, uh, so we've primarily been focused on uh, additive manufacturing integrated with a cellular metabolism. So using uh, 3D printing as our, our way to, um, to create um, a, as a new type of advanced manufacturing form. And so what this generally uh, would involve is some combination of polymeric precursors and engineered cells um, that would use uh, some 3D printer to produce a, a three-dimensional construct that would have um, the, the cells encapsulated within uh, the polymer matrix. So there are two ways to think about how we can use the cells within these materials. And so the first is for a biosustained production. So here we are trying to sustain the uh, viability and metabolic activity of the cells for infinity. Right? And so we, we, when we incorporate these cells into our polymer matrices, then we can use these for um, biocatalysis or immobilized catalysis, or even start thinking about the production of uh, dynamic or autonomous responses within these 3D printed constructs. But, and then there's also ELMS uh, for bio-augmented production. And here, it's the same idea of encapsulating the cells within these polymer networks that are 3D printed. But now what we want is production from the cells to augment the properties of the material. So for example, while the polymer network on its own might have some mechanical properties, we can have the cells produce some component that could augment those mechanical properties, uh, maybe making the material stiffer than what you started from. So uh, some of the material limitations and challenges. Uh, so first, of course, is the, the processability into uh, the 3D form factors. So how do we create um, the fine features or, or high resolution constructs uh, and, um, and complex geometries uh, using a 3D printer? Uh, building more complexity into the cell, uh, meaning you know, can we think about printing more than one cell type uh, into these designs, uh, more mimicking a, a living structure. Uh, and then of course, um, you know, as we're printing, we also have to be concerned with cell viability and metabolic activity, and then also the mechanical properties of this printed construct, right? So is, you know, we're trying to use a 3D printer to create some three-dimensional form factor, but this construct has to hold its shape as well. So I, I will talk about um, uh, two different stories today. Um, the first one is where we've used uh, tri-block copolymers for direct right 3D printing of bioreactors. And so here uh, we're thinking about ways to use these constructs for on-demand production of uh, pharmaceutical precursors and products. And then uh, the second part is focused more on uh, creating biodegradable constructs. And uh, so this isn't quite a complete story, but, but I'll share uh, where we are at the moment in using proteins in our 3D printers. So um, yeah, so we are interested in uh, creating immobilized cell bioreactors and, and, and largely trying to change the paradigm of a bioreactor from a batch process to a continuous one by immobilizing cells within a hydrogel. And uh, the thought was that we could use a, a 3D printer then 
to print or to pattern these uh, polymer cell constructs into uh, some lattice form or some other three-dimensional form factor, and then provide the cells a substrate that can be transformed into a desired product. And so the advantages here uh, are the reduced reactor downtime because you're not having, you can do this in a continuous fashion now. Um, ideally, this would also simplify product recovery because you're not separating the cells from the product and also uh, provide some opportunities to minimize uh, inhibition and toxicity that might be associated with the product that is being produced. Uh, so in order to, to make this happen, uh, what we need uh, is a robust material, ideally one that is inert to the substrate, uh, to the pH or other conditions uh, that are required for production. And then uh, also a, a cell, a very, sim very simple and cell compatible method uh, for fabrication. So th this concept is not new. We're not the first to come up with this idea. Um, you can immobilize cells within calcium alginate, for example, or via electrospinning. Uh, but what we've done is to produce elms uh, via a direct right process uh, within hydrogel. And, and this is what I'll focus on today. Our favorite material, or material of choice, uh, we refer to as F127 uh, BUM. I'm sorry, it says DMA here, but it should be BUM. And uh, so what we do is we start with a commercially available tri-block copolymer uh, known as F127. This is a, a pleuronic. And uh, we just do a one-step modification of the chain ends to introduce these methacrylate groups onto the two termini. And then if you take this polymer, you dissolve it at 25 to 35 weight percent in water, you get a hydrogel. Uh, but what's important is that this hydrogel is stimuli responsive in several ways. And the stimuli responses are uh, a temperature response, a shear response, and a light response. And the combination of these three uh, is what allows us to print these into three-dimensional structures that we can use for biocatalysis. So uh, my group has spent a lot of time uh, investigating these materials, and I'm just going to summarize um, some of the key features of the gels that we've developed over this time, including the F127BUM hydrogels. So the first is that uh, these hydrogels have a temperature-dependent gelation, uh, and that is at, <clears throat> at uh, room temperature, we have this nice self-supporting gel. This is a magnet that's suspended in that gel there. But then if you stick this gel in a refrigerator or in an ice bath, the gel will, will melt. And this is a reversible process. And when it gels, it very readily flows. Okay? It's, it's liquid. Uh, and so uh, this, is, this is really nice because this allows us to introduce the cells into the gel homogeneously. Right? So we cool the gel down, it becomes a liquid, we add the cells, we stir it up for homogeneous distribution, warm it up to room temperature again, and then it's ready for printing. So um, let's see. Might have to give this a second here. The next part involves a, um, a video, so maybe it's slowing things down. Uh, let me just give it a second. Let's see if I can. You could just wave your hands convincingly to to show what's on the video. Yeah. Okay. It's so. So yeah. So um. So let me see if I can. Yeah. So I guess it's it seems to be stalled. Oh, there we go. Okay. So um. Yeah. So so the next important feature of these gels is that they shear thin. Okay, so what we do is we transfer these gels into a, into a syringe. We, we, we fit a nozzle to the end of the syringe. And then if we apply a pressure, then this gel will flow out of the nozzle. Uh, but then once it exits the nozzle, it regains its gel state again. Okay, and so this allows us to extrude this gel into very nice filaments. Uh, but then once we've extruded these filaments, uh, these filaments have a sufficient yield strength such that um, the gels don't flow, continue to flow over time. And that allows us to create these multi-layered constructs of these gels. And then finally, 
um, we do a, a photo cure at the end. What, what I mean is that after we've printed the entire construct, then we come back and we irradiate with light. And that initiates a, a radical polymerization of those methacrylate groups, the chain ends of the polymer. And then now that permanently fixes the gel so that we get these robust constructs. Okay, so, so we can incorporate cells uh, like yeast into our gels, and then we can extrude them and, and cure the structures. And then over time, if we submerge this in media, the cells will grow. And, and we can visually observe the formation of colonies within these hydrogels. Uh, and so uh, printing a, a construct like this, so a, a multi-layered lattice construct then that has these yeast, if we submerge this construct into a solution of glucose, then the, the yeast cells that are inside will transform that glucose into ethanol over time. And so that's true uh, whether we're changing the concentration of glucose or, or even um, the initial cell seeding within these hydrogel constructs. Um, but you know what's really cool about these structures is that they are reusable over time. And so if we take the printed construct and leave it into a solution of glucose for two or three days, and then take that construct out and put it into a fresh solution of glucose, then we see that the production of ethanol over time is constant. And, and we track this for a period of about two weeks where we saw this nearly constant production of ethanol. Uh, my student actually took this out to a period of one year and still over that period of time, uh, the production of ethanol was, was constant. And, and so, uh, so then we started thinking about how we can um, achieve greater complexity in these structures, right? So, um, you know, looking at how uh, nature uses um, bioreactors, uh, spatial organization is important, uh, for example, in, in the rumen of a cow or even the hindgut of a, of a cockroach. And, and the spatial organization is important for segregating the different microbes that are required for, uh, for metabolism or for digestion. Uh, but these microbes are not necessarily uh, uh, co-hospitable or, or, co or compatible. And so uh, we also demonstrated then that uh, we can perform this uh, multi-kingdom printing uh, using uh, three different inks. So these are all based on F127BUM hydrogels, but now we have one that has bacteria, a second that has algae, and a third that has yeast. But, and now we can start to produce these uh, multi uh, kingdom constructs using these hydrogels. So an, an interesting um, uh, piece that we learned here was really by looking at the interface uh, with these gels. So for example, uh, looking at the gel-gel interface between a, a red fluorescent yeast gel containing gel and a green fluorescent E. coli containing gel, uh, this is after seven days. Uh, looking at the boundary between them, we see that uh, that boundary is still pretty sharp. And what we don't observe is the infiltration of the yeast into the E. coli hydrogel. And we don't see the infiltration of the E. coli into the yeast hydrogel. Similarly, if we look at the, the gel liquid boundary, okay, so, so I should note that here that um, over time, we do observe cells escape the gel into liquid media. Okay, so if we have a liquid media that contains red fluorescent yeast and a green fluorescent E. coli gel, then the E. coli and the gel will escape into the liquid after a period of a couple of days. But what we don't observe is the E. coli infiltrating into the yeast gel and that's also true if we flip things around, if we have um, the green fluorescent E. coli uh, in the liquid media and um, the uh, red fluorescent yeast in the gel. So it, it appears that whatever, whatever cells or, or whatever uh, microbe is inoculated into these gels, they, they seem to establish themselves in such a way that uh, the infiltration from the outside is not possible. Uh, but then uh, we started this great collaboration that we have with Hal Alper at uh, UT Austin. And, and Hal uh, does a, a lot of uh, metabolic engineering of um, different uh, microbes, including yeast and E. coli. And so with Hal, we started to look at a more complex production 
um, and, and systems. And so, uh, so we've gone now from um, just taking glucose to make ethanol to more sophisticated molecules. Um, so that uh, our list now includes a butane diol. Uh, we can make peptides like alpha factor or even antibiotics like colicin 5. Uh, but we could also, uh, with multi-material printing, produce these uh, parallel consortia where we can have one uh, glucose consuming yeast and a second strain of yeast that's xylose consuming. And so in, uh, in liquid culture, these two would be competing with each other and the glucose consuming yeast will always outcompete uh, the xylose um, consuming yeast. And, and so here, because we're immobilizing these in separate gels, we can sustain them independently uh, for the production of ethanol. Uh, and then uh, finally, we've also produced this cross-feeding consortium uh, where we can mix uh, different uh, uh, families now where we have uh, E. coli that's been engineered to produce L-DOPA and then yeast that's been engineered to produce, to transform L-DOPA into beta-xanthin. Uh, and so in fact, uh, when we have this cross-feeding consortium, these are in two separate adjacent gels, we should mention. Um, uh, what we find is that, again, these structures are reusable over time, uh, just, uh, just like I showed with the first case using uh, with the production of ethanol from glucose. Um, and so this is for the round, rounds of reuse across the x-axis here. Uh, interesting experiment uh, that we did here is that, uh, so we're tracking the, the beta xanthin production. So after the fifth round of reuse, uh, we halted the experiment and we either lyophilized this gel or we stuck it in a refrigerator for cold storage. Uh, but um, in particular, in the case of this lyophilized construct, we're removing all the water and we're left behind with just the polymer and the cells. And these constructs are shelf stable for up to three months. So if at any moment in time, we take this construct and put it back into media, then they will immediately begin to produce again. They begin to produce beta xanthin, and the level of production is essentially the same as uh, pre-preservation. So, so we're really excited about this because not only now can we reuse these constructs for uh, the purpose of production, but also these are shelf stable as well. Uh, and so this is just comparing then uh, beta xanthin production in the gels versus liquid cultures. So uh, we do see that there is um, the production of beta xanthin is production is higher than the case of the reuse uh, when we use the gels versus liquid culture. Uh, and then uh, finally, just to compare beta xanthin production from our F127B UM gel versus calcium alginate gels. And uh, there is an advantage to using our hydrogels. And we believe that the, the real advantage, there are two advantages here. So for one, our hydrogel networks are covalently cross-linked versus calcium alginate, uh, which is ionically cross-linked. And the calcium alginate gels can start to disintegrate over time versus our gels, which are more robust. Uh, but also if you're producing a product or a molecule that has any type of charge associated with it, that charge can interact with the calcium alginate gel. And uh, that may be what we're seeing here in that um, the, we, we observe higher production of beta xanthin in the F127 gel, but it's not to say that the production is higher, but it could be that a lot of the product is just getting trapped within this charged gel network. So just to kind of summarize this first part, um, what we've demonstrated then is uh, we have this uh, F127BUM hydrogel, uh, that allows us to incorporate microbes. We can print that gel into different three-dimensional constructs and then either uh, take that gel and preserve it in a dried state and that dried state is stable for at least three months or uh, we can take it into um, the production uh, state uh, where we can use it for the continuous production of uh, the desired product. So I want to, to switch gears and talk about a slightly different platform that we've been developing. And these are uh, protein-based bioplastics um, that, we could, that we are starting to gear toward uh, the production of ELMS. And the ultimate goal here 
is to have elms uh, that can be fully uh, biodegradable. So the F127 BUM hydrogel platform works great, uh, but it is not ultimately degradable. And uh, what we wanted was to be able to produce something that could uh, degrade. And uh, we're also using a different type of printing as well. So whereas before we were using extrusion printing here, we're using uh, laser scanning SLA printing. And in this type of printing, what we have is a, a vat. And uh, this orange material here is supposed to be the liquid resin. Uh, so it has to be liquid. The bottom of this vat is transparent. Okay. And so what we can do is use light to pattern the material through the transparent layer underneath. And then we're printing just a, a very thin layer, one layer at a time until we can produce the entire printed construct. And then um, in, in a second step, uh, we may have to uh, cure the material to get uh, the mechanical properties that we need. So there are two important considerations here when uh, using this type of um, printing. So we're using a commercially available Form 2 printer, and uh, this uses this rastering laser. So you can see how fast this laser is, is rastering across the surface. And what it is doing is it's drawing the pattern of just that one layer. And that layer is anywhere between 50 microns and 100 microns thick. Okay, And so now you see this liquid resin uh, being swiped, and it this liquid resin has to reflow because we're, since we're printing one layer at a time, we have to um, apply that next layer of resin to, uh, for printing, okay? So the two most important considerations then, the rate of photo curing or how fast we can cure the material to harden it. And then the second is the resin viscosity. So it's really important that this resin be liquid or have a low viscosity. Okay, so our strategy here is to use proteins. And uh, largely, we can separate proteins into two different classes. Uh, the first, um, and probably the most common way to think about structure in nature, is using structural proteins. Now, the thing about structural proteins is that they tend to be uh, filamentous or anisotropic. So whether we're talking about actin um, or, or fibrin or collagen, uh, these are all linear structures. And the problem with trying to pattern linear structures in, in the type of printing that we are trying to work with is that um, the linear structures will have a higher viscosity, right? So these, these proteins aren't meant to flow. Now, on the other hand, globular proteins, um, like uh, different enzymes or, or carriers, uh, are, tend to be very compact and well-defined in their shape. And um, it's actually our strategy to use these globular proteins to create three-dimensional structure. And so uh, we started with um, bovine serum albumin or BSA as our macromolecular building block. Um, what we like about it is that it can be biosourced. Um, since it's a protein, it's also biodegradable. It has excellent solubility in water. Okay, so, so this, the, the protein has evolved actually to, to be really, really soluble, right? You don't want this protein crashing out in your blood, but uh, so this, this protein has great solubility in water. You can dissolve it up to 50 weight percent in water and still have a solution that flows. Uh, and, and so I won't be talking about the stored length uh, within these proteins today, uh, but um, you know, what's amazing to me from a, a polymer chemistry perspective is that you can start with this linear chain that has a really high molecular weight uh, from a polymer chemistry point of view, right? 66,000, uh, 66.5 kilodaltons. And uh, this linear chain can be folded into a very compact globular structure, almost like a nanoparticle. Um, but we can take this structure now and modify the surface to uh, have it be compatible with 3D printing. So, um, so the BSA we buy by the kilogram, and uh, we, can, we can take it and do a one-step methacrylation of the available lysines on the surface to produce a methacrylated BSA, or we refer to it as MABSA. And we do this on a, on a 40 to 50 gram scale in a single batch. All right, so, so again, the, the important feature of using BSA is that it has great solubility. And so if we compare um, concentration of protein 
um, or the, visco the viscosity of a solution as you increase the concentration of a protein, comparing three different proteins here. So gelatin, methacrylate, um, which is commonly used for different photo patterning processes, uh, you'll see that uh, very, it very rapidly increases its viscosity, uh, but that's because it's forming these anisotropic structures. Um, silk fibroin that's been digested uh, also will increase as well, although not quite as rapidly as uh, gelatin methacrylate. Uh, but here um, with the methacrylated BSA, we can quite comfortably get to about 30 weight percent and maintain a, a pretty low viscosity. This green line here represents the maximum suggested viscosity for a resin. Um, although in our hands, we think that it's actually um, lower is better and, and 10 might even be getting to be too high. Okay, so, uh, so we can achieve low viscosity resins with uh, MABSA, uh, but we do have to co-formulate it with a few things in order to make a printable resin. So this is an aqueous based resin, so it is in water, but we co do co-formulate co with a bit of PEG diacrylate. I'll get to why in a second here. Uh, we use a ruthenium complex as a photocatalyst, just a small amount, and then we need use SPS as a radical generator. So now, um, so we use a, a photoreometer to look or to track the rate of photo curing. Right? So uh, we're looking at the change in storage modulus is essentially just saying uh, the stiffness of the material, right? So we're going from liquid resin and as this liquid resin cures, it's becoming stiff. So, so we can track that. Uh, and then we're tracking that over time after irradiation with light. And uh, so this is just for a um, for frame of reference here. This is just the commercially available resin for making a, a, a plastic using a, a Form 2 printer, okay? And uh, so this is what that uh, trace looks like. Now, if we, if we formulate with just our MABSA uh, without the PEG diacrylate in there, you see that the, the rate of photo curing is actually kind of slow, right? There's this this lag period before we see uh, a significant increase in the storage modul modulus or the stiffness of this material. So um, this is way too long, right? So this is not gonna work with the printers. But what we found is that if we introduce some PEG diacrylate to the formulation, now we get a very fast response and, and we're getting the photo curing speeds that is necessary uh, for the SLA printer. So um, just, you know, uh, quickly here, uh, what we do is to formulate our resin, and then in the Form 2 printer, uh, we can now print these constructs. An interesting feature uh, about this particular uh, protein resin is that because we're only using light to pattern this material, uh, <clears throat> we are not doing anything to the conformation of the proteins. However, if we thermally cure this material, we can actually denature these proteins and that helps a lot with mechanical properties because we can transform the largely intramolecular interactions of these proteins into intermolecular ones and we create a, a, a stiffer and tougher material. And just to kind of give you a sense of you know, how well we can print these materials, now these are side-by-side -side comparisons. The clear material is the commercially available resin. The orange ones uh, that are next to them are our printed hydrogels, right? So I, I should mention again, uh, because we formulated these in water, when they're photo cured, these are hydrogels, but these hydrogels are actually mechanically very stiff. And I, I told my student to put some weights on this hydrogel so we can give people a sense of how stiff these hydrogels are. And he took me quite literally because he went to the gym and put weights on this a printed puck, but you can see here that there's no sign of mechanical damage after putting uh, this, this 20 pounds of weight on the hydrogel. Uh, and so in fact, the, these do have a, a, a compressive modulus that approaches cartilage. Uh, but we can now print more complex designs as well. All right, and, and so I, sh I should say that these do contain cells. Right, so they do contain yeast cells, um, but we can, with these yeast cells inside, print these different geometries and designs. And we're, we can also now produce um, mechanically functional parts. Right? So taking this nut and bolt, uh, we can actually uh, screw them together. And, and again, these are hydrogel constructs. So uh, this is where I'll, I'll end here for today. 
um, you know, so what, what I hope to have conveyed is that, um, you know, elms or engineered living materials rely on uh, cellular and polymeric function. But what's really exciting about these materials is that we use the polymer function to uh, provide mechanical stability, to create processability of these materials. And then we can use the cells to uh, provide additional um, function, whether it's for the production of um, a different pharmaceutical compounds or what we hope in the future for uh, uh, creating these, uh, a really nice interplay between a biodegradable matrix and the cells that reside within them. And, um, and then also uh, with 3D printing, uh, we can produce elms that have a broad range of form factors now, again, having this process abilities. And I think that there are a lot of opportunities to uh, continue to engineer the cells to continue to engineer the polymers to create uh, new functions and new materials. And uh, we're very much open to, to collaborating uh, with anyone who might be interested with some, uh, some uh, new ideas. Uh, so with that, I just want to first acknowledge the group and the teams uh, for uh, the, their, all of their contributions uh, that have really led to the success of our work uh, since I've been at the UW. All of our collaborators here, um, who have uh, who've been great to work with, uh, funding agencies for their support. Uh, and uh, Kate, I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions if uh, there uh, might be any out there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Al, that is an awesome talk. There are uh, several questions in chat. Can you see it? Yes, so let me, yeah. Um, yeah, organic chemistry for the win, absolutely. Yeah, uh, so could you use hydrogels like that in making artificial organelles inside liposomes? Um, yes, interesting. So I, I don't, so we are not at, the, at that resolution, right? So the smallest structures that we can print are um, you know, probably on the micron feature size. And so that's probably not quite small enough to be an organelle inside of a, of a cell, or I guess if it's a liposome, maybe if you can make a large liposome, uh, we can imagine making some small beads or, or structures that might fit inside. Um, if, and if I, if I don't answer your, your question uh, sufficiently, please yeah, be, yeah, uh, feel free to unmute yourself or um, to, to add additional questions in the chat. Um, so pore sizes of these hydrogels, yeah, that's a really good question. You know, um, so so first I, I will say that the uh, the hydrogels uh, for the F one two seven BUM, they, you know, these are thirty weight percent, right? Thirty percent by weight polymer, seventy percent water, and so so they are mostly water. And when we look at these hydrogels um, after lyophilizing them and uh, by SEM, then you know, we see structures that are on the order of five to 10 microns. So poor structures that are on the order of five to 10 microns. Uh, it's, it's always hard to tell how representative those structures are after you lawfulize them, but you know, maybe that gives some indication of how large those pores can be. Um, and, and then, you know, but getting to a, a more of a molecular scale, uh, when, when we take our polymer and we cross-link it, we are creating this molecular network. Uh, we, we don't really have a good, we haven't really done any calculations to see you know, what the mesh size of our network uh, is. Uh, and then uh, how can we control the density of bacteria or enzyme in the hydrogel? Um, yeah, and then how high can you go without compromising the stability of the hydrogel? Yeah, so uh, we typically load these hydrogels with um, 10 to the six or 10 to the seven cells per gram. And, you know, that's just, that's just our standard seeding concentration, but within these gels, the, the cells grow, you know, so well at that seeding concentration, the gels are transparent, but over time we can see these structures go opaque um, because the, the cells are just growing within the gel. So um, one of the, the challenges and, and one of the things that we're trying to do is to be able to control the stiffness of the gel to the point where we can restrict the growth of the cells. You know, so, so in the case of yeast, for example, is it possible to um, prevent 
the cells from growing at all, you know? So can we encapsulate these cells to the point where you know, they're metabolically active, um, but they're just not dividing. So sort of achieving this, this quiescent state with the cells, uh, but we haven't been able to, to do that um, to this point in time. Uh, so question from Ahmed about, um, can you encapsulate liposomes in the hydrogel? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question, and, and that's something that we're trying out now. Uh, so this is something that we've talked to Kate about, and uh, so, so that my student and, and her student are, have been talking and looking at whether there might be an opportunity there to, to do that. Um, so from Andreas, uh, follow up on Ahmed's question, can you encapsulate liposomes that would do TXTL? Yeah, so so... That, that is an interesting question as well. Um, so James Carruthers in chemical engineering department here at UW um, you know, is, uh, is actually another collaborator that we have uh, where we've started to, to look at this. Um, we, ha we haven't made it very far yet, uh, but you know, this is something that we are actively uh, working on. Uh, what is the temperature range for the hydrogels? Um, so, so as far as uh, the, the gel state, anything above room temperature, we can maintain the gel state. And then um, the, the transition temperature where the gels go from gel to liquid, uh, anything below the, we can measure, when we measure that transition temperature, it's about 17 degrees or so. So theoretically, anything below 17 degrees Celsius, the gels should be softening and, and liquefying. But, but Normally we go down to about five degrees when we're doing our normal processing. Uh, and then uh, Daria asks, uh, could you use hydrogel to protect bacteria from the environment? Uh, for example, to make an extremophile from E. coli. Oh, um, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. That's an interesting idea though. Um, maybe, maybe something worth looking at. Uh, and then uh, Terence asks, uh, can you use hydrogel to store enzymes and then dissolve the gel to mix the enzymes to start the reaction? Yeah, so this, this would be an interesting idea. Um, but I think with the enzymes, um, it depends, right? So uh, if the enzymes can be preserved non-covalently within the gel, then yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. I, I think that's an interesting idea. Um, if the enzymes have, if you want the enzymes to be immobilized within the gel, then, um, you know, then of course, I think that there's more to investigate with respect to, um, you know, whether the, the tethering of the enzymes affects their activity. Um, but if it's simply just to dissolve the gel, just you know, to pr provide a preserved state, yeah, it might be possible. Let's see. So, yeah. So, so um, any, any other questions, uh, feel free to post questions in the chat or uh, to unmute yourself if you'd like as well. Um, I have a question that might be naive and maybe I'm missing something, but um, you say bacteria can grow and divide inside the hydrogel. What do they eat? Ah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so we, we, the gels are immersed in, uh, or submersed in media. And so the, the nutrients required to sustain the cells can readily diffuse in and out. Um, you know, I, I think the only issue with diffusion is probably oxygen. And so uh, I, I think that the, the permeability of oxygen could be lower just based on some of the uh, recent results that we've had. And we published some of this uh, work related to uh, dissolved oxygen as well, uh, just earlier this year. Let's see. Oh, and then um, let's see, Nate asks, so for scale production, do you think other methods than additive manufacturing uh, would be viable or preferable? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so it doesn't have to be uh, 3D printing necessarily. Um, you know, so for example, these gels that we extrude, it, it may not be the case that we need to have some ordered lattice and that just some random non-woven mat uh, is sufficient for these structures, um, uh, for these bioreactors. 
I'm really excited to see what are the limits of this technology. What um, kind of what? How much can you put in a hydrogel? What kind of a? Um, I guess what kind of a limitation you can have, especially if you start using it for uh, things like synthetic cell organelles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, us too. <laughs> yeah. So no, I mean, I, and I think that's what makes us really exciting, right? Um, that there are a lot of opportunities to see how much we can push the limits of these materials and um, to to push even the the synthetic biology side of things, or um, or even cell free aspects of um, of biology. Totally. Yeah. Okay, uh, so if there are no, no other questions, thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, to share this with the community here. And uh, if anybody's interested, please feel free to, to reach out. We're happy to, to collaborate. Bye.